Uh, welcome to GMA Talk. On um, this week, we are happy and glad to be talking about the benefits of refugees because most of the time we just hear of the negative of refugees. Uh, but today we are very glad to have with us uh, Albert Yumbire, uh, who is currently uh, in Rwanda, a former Congolese refugee who has been through a lot of, lot of hardship, a lot of trouble, but he has made a living of him, for himself and also for those around him. Welcome, Obed. How are you today? <laughs> I'm fine, Gerard. How are you? Ah, I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for being able to join us here on the GMA Talk, where we really focus and highlighting on the uh, refugees uh, around the world and also the amazing work you know, that refugees are also doing around the world and is in the refugee camp. Yeah, my pleasure, my brother. Ah, okay, awesome. So basically, we just uh, start, you know, first of all, just uh, introduce yourself uh, in terms of uh, who you are, you know, uh, uh, where, you, where you are now, uh, how you got there and uh, where you come from. And then we'll get in a little bit later in terms of uh, the full history of yours. Yes, uh, my name is Tuyumvire Obed, as uh, you have said before. Um, I'm natively from Congo, uh, Eastern Congo, of course. I was born at the roundabout of Congo, Rwanda and Burundi, just on Congo side in the volcanoes mm. there. So that area has been in uh, uh, troubles for three decades now. And um, now I'm age, my age is also three decades. So you understand that I was born in the war and raised in the war and wow. yes. Yeah, so, um, being a refugee is my life is my entire life is not a kind of part of life or mm -hmm. a part of the journey so i have been a, a refugee since my, my childhood since my early age and uh, till now i'm adult i can be able to uh, to go out and work uh, but also still as a refugee yeah uh, okay. yeah this is uh, mm -hmm. well a uh, particularity of me yeah well, thank you very much uh, for uh, sharing that a little bit of uh, where you were born. Uh, it's very um, unique that you were born in the geographical area of like three countries. So basically, uh, do you belong to Congo, Rwanda and Burundi? Or like, how do you identify yourself when you tell people like where you come from or, or which refugee uh, you are? Nah. Yeah, actually, I, I, um, I, I say I'm just on Congo side, but of course, it's, it's a natural boundary uh, mm -hmm. between Congo, Rwanda, and, and Uganda. Uh, before colonialism, uh, that's come back. Uh, it, it was not, there was not a boundary. There was not a, a border. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was a free area. So and, and until now, I think it's difficult to say the volcano belongs to this country or to this uh -huh. country. Yeah, it's it's a it's a kind of natural boundary. So we are, we were born there, and mm -hmm. we are we are citizens of the three countries. I can say I'm confident to say that I'm a citizen of Rwanda, a citizen of Congo, a citizen of Uganda. Yeah. yeah. More okay. Of, we, have, uh, we have relatives there and there, and we are free yeah. to move on. Yes. Okay. Wow. That's a uh, very good and very unique. So, but and then in terms of um, your refugee journey, really, you know, when did it start? You know, how did it start? You know, and uh, where did you live uh, for most of uh, your life uh, in in that period? Yeah, firstly, um, uh, I, I I left Congo uh, in 1992, uh, 1993. Uh, I was three years that time, and we we passed through Uganda, so I had to live in Uganda for one year okay. before. Before crossing to Rwanda, um, after right after the genocide, 1994, at the end of the year, so it was. Uh, it was, then from from that time we have been in Rwanda for about ten years. When I decided to step out and, uh, but still we under the refugee status yeah. to step out and see what I can do outside. Mm -hmm. So basically, when you talk about, so you you left in at uh, Uganda first, and then in uh, Rwanda. Like, were you by yourself, like as you say, like three or two years old, or were you, were you with a family member? And also in Rwanda, like which uh, refugee camp or refugee settlement 
uh, that did you settle in? Yeah, in Uganda, we were not able to, uh, to, to join other refugees in the settlements. Uh, we, we crossed free, uh, as, as uh, freelancers, I can say, refugees who are not uh, in the hands of HCR. Mm. Um, and uh, we had to survive actually by ourselves, like wow. my father, my whole family. Uh, and my father is, is a passionate uh, a passionate teacher mm -hmm. and when we arrived in Uganda, Congo is a French country so he couldn't find a job. So we struggled a lot ar around the Uganda border mm -hmm. wow. uh, before deciding to cross to Rwanda to join other refugees. Remember, um, we crossed to Uganda not because we wanted to cross to Uganda but it was the nearest country and it was a, the only choice uh, because Rwanda was under going under the genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, we, the only choice was Uganda, and and then Uganda is a, such a big country as well for for crossing by foot. It's impossible. So being at the south in Uganda, you can easily you couldn't easily um, join other refugees in Uganda who are mostly in central or north. So it was a very big, a good choice to cross to Rwanda to join others in a, in the Biumba resettlement. It's in northern Rwanda, just mm -hmm. near the border of Uganda with Uganda. Mm -hmm. So we could we could just uh, cross and, and join others, about thousands of them. Okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for putting that into picture because I can only imagine like the difficulties that it uh, must have been, you know, crossing or trying to find refugee in a country that was going under genocide. Because as we know, during the genocide, even like millions and millions of Rwandis, they were finding uh, refuge, you know, in Congo, like at that time. So, but, and then, you know, for people really like uh, trying to find shelter, you know, in Rwanda at that time, I can only imagine you know, it can be very, very like uh, challenging. But uh, so in the refugee settlement then, uh, which kind of uh, support did you receive uh, in the settlement? And uh, how was it like day-to-day -day -day life uh, in the settlement? Yeah, honestly, uh, at the, when we arrived at the, the first days, uh, it was, uh, we, were, we were taken as, a, as kindergartners. We were really, uh, in good hands because uh, that time, yes, yet many refugees, there were many crossing uh, around the region, mm -hmm. but at least the HCR and uh, other humanitarians were very active to, to react, I mean, to, to respond on some, some of the needs. Yeah, um, not 100%, but at least uh, my experience on the first days in the refugee camp were very wonderful. We could get porridge, we could get uh, biscuits, and uh, all the basic needs mm -hmm. that a kid wants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but eventually, with time, it's, it's changed, of course. Uh, it will be another story. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's uh, okay. And then, uh, then, how did you, in terms of um, make it out of. Uh, uh, the refugee camp and uh, you know when you talk about education when you know, when you talk about employment when you talk about like uh, dreams and goals like how did you really start making it out of the settlement and establishing yourself uh, as you are today yeah uh, just previously i said it could be another story if we, we talk about the the next years in the refugee mm -hmm. camp mm -hmm. wow uh, yeah. From there, then, and the experience at the refugee camp went uh, slowly by slowly in a very wrong way that wow. uh, the, the young people could, uh, could uh, achieve their primary studies, I mean, uh, the basic studies, primary school. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, uh, you, you have the chance to go uh, three years further and under the support of humanitarians. Mm -hmm. But but if you are you are done with uh, nine basic years, you you can go you can go by your for your own. You can they leave you there, and you have to find your own way to continue. Yeah. So that was the kick 
I mean, the, 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 the challenge, the first challenge that I had to face from the, that pushed me to go out. Mm-hmm. So I could go out and see if I can find a, a way to continue my studies. Yeah. And that way to go out then teached me how also to, to integrate other, other, the other societies and uh, to understand the world as a global picture beyond the refugee camp. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay, and then thank you for sharing that. But, and then understand now uh, you founded and ran a tourism company called uh, Kumbu Kumbu Tours. Uh, you know, as, as, as a person in your situation or as a person with a lack of much support, you know, how was it really possible, you know, like being a refugee or going from a refugee, like to establish like a tourism <laughs> tour company? And what are some of the challenges and how did you really manage to establish such a company? That's a very good question. I'm glad you know Kumbu Kumbu Tours because uh, it's still a baby. For sure, yeah. I, I, I love uh, the work that the organization does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so actually, um, the inspiration from, uh, uh, I mean, to found a tour company, not a, another kind of business, it's from my childhood, of course. Uh, as I told you, I was born around the volcanoes where we keep uh, the last uh, mountain gorillas in the world. So tourists could cross every time from Uganda, from Rwanda to come and, uh, and track those animals in, in Volcano National Parks, in Virunga National Park on Congo side. So for my childhood, I still remember that seeing tourists passing behind, be, be, uh, before, I mean, passing uh, in front of your, your house, um, our house was just at the road and uh, enjoying them passing, uh, yelling, Muzungu, Muzungu. So those childhood memories then uh, came back uh, when I, 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 after my, my secondary studies outside of the camp. So I could then figure out what I can do in Rwanda and at the same time doing it in Uganda, sometimes doing it in Congo, which is my mm-hmm. country. So, but the, then the, that feeling of you have that you have that inspiration that feeling of I want to sell my experience. I know those countries very well. I know the region very well. It's it's an attractive region. So I yeah. I, I, I this is a very huge opportunity to yeah. catch. Yeah, as a, you don't need for me. I di- I didn't need really to go to go. Informed about the the information, uh, the guiding information around. So I could only pick information from my own experience and share them with tourists, and that was a very very big selling point. So I think uh, that that's then uh, drive my my choice. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, it's very interesting and great to hear in terms of uh, the childhood growing up in the area. You know, witnessing yeah. uh, the gorillas and the env- and the environment around you, and uh, you know, wanting to use your story and your environment and your your childhood, you know, to really establish uh, such a company. Uh, but uh, how did you get support in terms of uh, officially uh, launching it? Yeah, it's a. It, I call it a, a tour company, but still, it was a, an, an informal business at the starting point. Mm-hmm. So I like many of my fellows, uh, it's really difficult to start a business in a very formal way as yeah. uh, it, it is in everywhere. Maybe I don't know, but for, especially for tourism, you don't need really uh, many formalities. You need just to go out to set your profile on the internet and try to market mm-hmm. yourself. So I started from scratch then. I didn't have any support in terms of investment mm-hmm. or so i could invest my knowledge invest my time mm-hmm. and then uh, uh, financials could come eventually and i invest there and there as much as yeah. i can money yeah, yeah. so mm-hmm. it's it was basically like that from scratch yeah. and yeah uh, so then uh, at the moment and how is uh, the organization operating is it in a good standing or uh, do you get uh, visitors, whether it's from Africa or abroad? Yeah, a part of the COVID-19, uh, the business was really rapidly growing. Uh, 
Wow. Last year, 2019, I was, uh, the company was about to, I mean, the, the, the client uh, cycle, the client's network was uh, around uh, 150 clients wow. by year. Yeah, this year we, we, we started it with the projection of getting 300 per year. Mm -hmm. So it was really, uh, let's say it was at 50% growing rapidly because of uh, firstly uh, our strategies and uh, our, our, our value propositions. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but then uh, with the COVID, of course, it's, it's a little bit uh, interrupted. And yeah. uh, we had uh, we had four people in our office permanent, wow. and uh, about about others fifteen uh, part time drivers, cookers, mm -hmm. porters, yeah, okay. kind of uh, those part time jobs. Yeah. yeah, it's a uh, it's 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 so promising. Wow, that's <laughs> awesome, man! It's uh, yeah, it seems like it's a very uh, awesome venture, and uh, it is growing as you have said, like. Uh, the projection of uh, this year uh, in terms of uh, the COVID-19 and uh, how that went. You know, it's very a great point then to transition in terms of, you know, talking about, you know, the positive contributions of uh, refugees, you know, in terms of the society that they live in. You know, uh, because even here uh, where I am uh, in Canada, you know, you always see uh, refugees are uh, giving back to the society, refugees working, refugee volunteering. You know, refugees establishing uh, businesses, you know, uh, refugees trying to see how they can uh, help and support others. So, but when you, when people think mostly of refugees, you know, the thing is just like uh, burdens on the nation or burdens as, as uh, on the shoulder. But when I hear your story and your case, you know, like you, as a, as a former refugee, you know, but now it seems that you are providing employment, you know, to, no, no, to other people global. like uh, in the region and, uh, and specifically like in the country of your resident. Like, you know, what can you uh, educate us more in terms of, you know, the benefits that uh, refugees bring uh, to the new home, the new societies? Yeah, yeah uh, let's, let's remind this. Uh, that term, that word, being a refugee or saying a refugee doesn't remove that you are a human being. Mm, that, uh, wow, man. That's have, uh, so true, yeah. Like some, uh, yes, like others. So it's, it, think it's, it means we have talents. We have mm. uh, passion. We have, uh, yeah, we have all the values that a human being can have. So uh, it's a matter of going out and exploit them. Yeah. So it that that's key uh, action is maybe for me uh, uh, which is not discovered by many many refugees yet uh, uh, yet yeah, that that, uh, that 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 habit of growing as refugees expecting aids and assistance from from the humanitarian yeah. that's cre has created in many of us a, a kind of dependence. Mm -hmm. uh, which is now a big barrier for young refugees to interpret. So they, yeah. they, 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 they get tired easily because of that. But mm -hmm. then, for me, uh, being an entrepreneur, a refugee entrepreneur, it's uh, twice being, uh, a, 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 being excellent. Yeah, because yet you have to, to resign and to overcome that habit of mm -hmm. expecting assistance and going out not only for surviving but also to help others yeah. this is this is a very uh, it's a double step uh -huh, so yeah. to get to get there uh, for young people they they want first to uh, to understand their situation and the, the most of uh, the thing that there are many things that are really uh, uh, they, they are stopping them to, 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 to ideate and to, to think about their life. Firstly, it's, it's that, uh, uh, that thing we call it resettlement. So when people have to wait 20 years in the refugee camp, mm, yeah. they are to, the resettlement to US or to Canada, yeah. to the Western countries. So mm -hmm. that has created a kind of uh, a, a transition, a very long transition in their life, 
so mm-hmm. that they cannot think uh, how to to develop themselves. Yeah. They think time will come when they are mm-hmm. in the US. Yeah, themselves. and that's a and that's <laughs> a very you know and that's a very key point because when you talk about that you know long term transition or long term uncertainty or long term uh, you know waiting, you know. But yeah. you know, and then when you speak about the humanitarian organization or the support. You know that uh, young people and just refugees in general can be offered, it, whether in refugee camps or just uh, or, or urban cities or wherever in the country of uh, residence. So, like, how can refugees be supported more in terms of education, in terms of vocational training, or in terms of accomplishing their dreams? Like, uh, what more can uh, organizations and uh, governments uh, do in, in that area? Well. Uh... I think uh, the, the, the best thing to do uh, is to, to establish bridges between the outside world and the, refi- the refugee settlement. Mm. Yeah, people in the refugee camp, most of the time, that's my experience. We, yeah. have, been clo- we have been closed under, uh, in fences. Mm. So that we- yeah, wow, it's a very, very interesting point. Yeah, because it's like refugee camps far from the city, like often it's like in the bush. Or like uh, nowhere in the middle, yeah. Yeah, you know, there are those uh, like concentrated houses with a lot, with, uh, I mean, 70 or 80 percent of young people together, but they don't know outside. Actually, they are, they are, they are, they are congested. They are, they are quarantined in a, in a mm. place so they cannot interact with outside. Yeah. That's for me the biggest uh, error, the biggest uh, mistake that has been uh, uh, there for for years, I think for now what the humanitarians can do is uh, to 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 establish those bridges and uh, to make sure they are playing the the middle the middle part mm-hmm. between the, the the country of um, the country the host country and the the refugee camp yeah. the refugee. Mm-hmm. so people can can go out easily people can access services easily mm-hmm. people can work easily the, yeah i think a lot of opportunities that a resident yeah. can have also not 100 percent but just to 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 make that excitement in the mm-hmm. refugee camp yeah. yeah and to allow them to go out to allow them to interact with their their fellows outside yeah. wow yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's very very uh, important point and a uh, message to really bring across because as you said you know most of the time those uh, camps and settlements, they are far away from the city, from interaction with the locals. You know, having like that uh, bridging uh, between like the locals and the refugees for sure, like the first step, you know, to try and help the refugees and then also for them uh, as the refugees also accessing uh, the opportunities in the area, you know, that also uh, locals are also uh, accessing uh, uh, from the government. You know, so yeah, it's very, very you know, important uh, for such for such message, you know, and uh, and call, you know, to be put to people in terms of to advocate for the local government and uh, organizations, you know, just to continue building that bridge between refugees and uh, host communities and locals, and see how everybody can live together and be supported, you know, accordingly. But uh, is there anything else, you know, that you like? You know, in terms of share, whether it's like in the refugee situation or, or your current venture, or just uh, in terms of the situation where you are right now. Yeah, uh, in terms of the situation where I am now, I can say uh, it's a very uh, big mistake as as well to only take people from Africa and or from Asia where in the war zones to those uh, so-called paradise in Europe or US without uh, uh, challenging their mindset. Mm. The, for me, among the criteria should be also a, 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 mind, a ready mindset, to, mm. a ready to work mindset. Yeah. So they, they could firstly give opportunities to those young people who firstly uh, want to go to study, want to go to work, Mm-hmm. So who have yeah. that, that uh, mindset, that uh, that's uh, that's motivation, mm-hmm. that's kind of ambition to go to go out. So they could assess that, not just taking people there. It's for me. It's it's it makes really sad to take someone 
who at uh, basically he's not able even to understand himself yeah. to take him to Europe and uh, and uh, maybe helping him there and I think it's 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 a, a bit confusing on my side but for me if I could be in the shoes of immaterial I could yeah. ask those young people who are ambitious mm-hmm. and give them yeah. the okay so can- yeah that's a, yeah it's a very very interesting point so then it goes back in terms of the point of you know supporting young people with education supporting with skills you know even like this uh, humanitarian organization such as IOM or UNHCR you know can continuously working with a local and international partnership uh, to establish those uh, scholarship opportunities you know for students like uh, in refugee camp and uh, and uh, across the country you know to study abroad okay well wow. now that's a really a uh, great uh, to share and uh, and a great message to bring uh, to bring across you know because you know that can also help and support you know refugees because at the end of the day you know especially you know from my experience and what i've seen you know refugees always end up like giving back you know at least the majority of them you know they just want to belong you know may, uh, build a future and also contribute you know to the society you know so thank you very much uh, you know uh, to you we uh, uh Obed, you know for really uh, speaking with us uh, today for educating us about you know just the benefits that the refugees you know bring to the table and how they can be supported and also mostly you know thank you very much for sharing your story you know hopefully you know i believe many people will be inspired uh, with how much you have accomplished of how far you have come you know and i believe that you know uh, people will be called to action in terms of you know pushing more uh, actions on the ground whether it's like local government and uh, action for more of a humanitarian organization to uh, support refugees with uh, vocational training and educational training and see how our life can um, uh, continue to transform you know uh, for many people you know so thank you very much uh, for your time any last word for our viewers of uh, GMA talk <laughs> actually I can say uh, this uh, this time refugees are waking up so you can wait for us on the on your your path oh, man, that, that's awesome that's very glad way of uh, finishing up thank you everybody for watching all the viewers of GMA talk be sure to subscribe and stay tuned on a weekly basis on the everything related to refugees and the world of politics right here on GMA talk with your host Gerard Mutabazi Amani love peace and unity take care and see you next time